Hello, Psych 101 students, and welcome to Module 4, Learning Objective 7, more on classical conditioning. Let's begin. Animals adapt via conditioning. So animals learn to, to predict what objects bring them pleasure or bring them pain. Um, you, you know, in order to survive well, you need to know um, things that are good for you, like uh, things to eat, for instance, and you need to know the dangers. So learning to predict outcomes leads to new adaptive behaviors. Let's look at some classical conditioning concepts. We'll begin with acquisition, which is the gradual formation of an association between conditioned and unconditioned stimuli. It occurs during the third step in classical conditioning trials. And it's uh, the phase during which a uh, conditioned uh, response is established. Um, strongest conditioning occurs when the conditioned stimulus is presented slightly before the unconditioned stimulus. So in the Pavlov example, you would want to, you know, play the metronome slightly before you present the food to the dog. Okay, let's um, play a little music here. In many suspenseful or scary movies, the soundtrack music becomes intense just before something exciting or happens. The classic mechanism because it uses this classical history of the Um, so, with this example, I mean, see if you can uh, identify all the classical conditioning components, in, you know, from this example using the classical conditioning template that I recently provided. Try to fill in what's the neutral stimulus going on here in this conditioning? What's the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned response? What's the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response? I'll leave that to you. Okay, extinction. Uh, this extinction is the reduction and uh, eventual elimination of the conditioned response, which would be the salivation in the Pavlov experiment. After the conditioned stimulus, the metronome, is presented repeatedly without the unconditioned stimulus, the food. So just to say that more simply, um, the dog is going to reduce its saliva output if you keep playing the metronome and not giving it food afterwards. And eventually it'll stop responding to the metronome at all. It'll start by, by reducing its response and then at some point it will completely stop. So this is that is what extinction is. You you keep you you keep giving the conditioned stimulus uh, without giving the unconditioned stimulus. You know, so you keep playing the metronome without giving food. And eventually the animal's gonna be like, hey this metronome used to used to mean something, but now it's like you know, 
It never predicts food, co food coming anymore, so I'm going to stop responding to it. So through extinction, the animal learns that the original association no longer holds true. That is, the metronome no longer is a signal for food. But we also have the concept of spontaneous recovery. And this occurs when a previously extinguished response reappears after a break without any additional conditioning. The response will be weaker than the previous peak peak, peak response. Um, I'll talk more about this on the next slide, you know, because because I have a figure, and we can see what what spontaneous. It'll be easier to see what spontaneous recovery is. So classical conditioning varies in strength and persistence, as shown by these four conditioning processes. Uh, let's go through them. So starting from left to right. In, in figure A, we, we see acquisition going on. This is when you're pairing the metronome with the food. So these are like the, the what's known as the learning trials. Um, and you can see that it doesn't take long for an animal to learn the pairing, that the metronome signals the food is, is about to come. So you know, but if you look up at that graph, I mean, the after about four pairings, you know, the the amount of saliva the animal is producing is, is is fairly high, and after about after about six trials, it's up at, at at the highest rate, pretty much. So you know, it only takes you know like you know about let's say, let's say you know in the neighborhood of half a dozen trials to get a maximum response um, um, to the conditioned stimulus. Um, so it's not taking, you know, in case you're wondering, it's not taking dozens or, or hundreds of trials for an animal to learn that one thing signals another. Um, okay, we see extinction occur in, in uh, the B picture. So at this point, you start playing the metronome and you're not, no longer given food after you play it. So you can see it goes down pretty quick. You know, once again, it, these things don't take long. Um, you know, it doesn't take long for the animals to respond. Um, so all of a sudden, there used to always be food after the metronome. Now there isn't. And so the saliva production drops pretty quickly. And you can see after, it only takes about a half dozen trials, once again, for it to get down to baseline. Uh, let me just get my pen here. Just uh, point out, you know, this is kind of a baseline. This is like the minimum amount of saliva. I could write baseline here. Uh, maybe I can't. <laughs> Base. Okay, this is going to look like I'm a, a two-year-old, but let's do it anyway. So the baseline, because saliva production never gets down to zero. So anyways, so this gets down to minimum, down to baseline after about six trials during the extinction phase. So, you know, it doesn't take long and the animal stops responding. So it is no longer, when, when you get to trial, I guess it would be trial 23, the, the animal is no longer responding to, to you playing the metronome. But here's where spontaneous recovery comes in. There needs to be a break. So like this is, this is all happening, these trials are all happening during one day. And now you 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 have a 24-hour rest period. So you wait a full day and you come back and you play the metronome again. So it, you know, at the end of, of the of the first day, it wasn't responding at all. So you you've waited a whole day, you come back, you play it, and and you know it's responding kind of at a halfway level. And um, this is what spontaneous recovery is, even though it had quit responding. You know, there's if you have enough of a break, then the animal will once again respond to the condition stimulus. It's kind of like, yeah, you know, it stopped working yesterday, but you know, may you know, I remember it used to it used to mean something, so I'm gonna, you know, maybe I'll respond, I'll, I'll I'll give it a go again. I'll respond to it, and maybe there's food coming. Um, so anyway, so so just note that that it is lower. 
this response is is lower than it, what it was, you know, doing back here, um, certainly. And once again, you, we're still not giving food after it. So you see, you know, after the spontaneous recovery, the extinction happens very quickly once again. But here we can do it again and get a second spontaneous recovery. We waited another full day, play the metronome again. But you can see once again, like it's it's much lower. You know, it's it's and then it goes down to baseline. You know, right away. So this is the the pattern you would see. And if we did another spontaneous recovery, uh, you you may not get anything, or you get like some, you know, low level, like just a cup, you know, a couple of drops. Of saliva, maybe. Um, okay, I, I'm not sure if there's anything else I need to do here. Um, so it gets weaker with the, each spontaneous recovery. Um, okay, I, I think that's that's good. Uh, da, 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 da. Give me one second here. I like to erase my ink. Oh, I got to get, sorry. Okay, sorry for this. Uh, I want to give her my pen. Okay, now I can click on the screen and here we go. Good to go. Stimulus generalization. Uh, stimulus generalization occurs when stimuli similar to the original condition stimulus. So something like, that. let's say it was close similar to the metronome. Um, uh, so it, generalization occurs when stimuli similar to the original condition of stimulus elicit the same condition response. So let's say, get the back up here. Let's say I have something that's like a metronome. I'm not sure what it would be, but something that makes a similar noise perhaps. And, and it you know looks a little bit the same. Um, so as long as if it was close enough and, and I, and I played it for the dog, let, let's say we're back, I don't know, in, in the acquisition phase or something, it's been learning with this, um, with this metronome here. And then I, all of a sudden I bring in, um, uh, once again, something that's similar to metronome, whatever it might be, even though, you know, the, the animal would know it's not exactly the same, but, but if it's close enough there will be a generalization that takes place where they respond to the similar stimuli. Um, let me go back here. Um, and then there's, there's reasons why this is important. Um, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say I'm, I'm out hiking and I get um, I get bit by a snake. Okay, I, and it's this long brown brown snake, uh, about three feet long, and and it bites me, and uh, yeah, it hurts, and I end up going to the doctor for it. And anyways, you know, I go, oh, you gotta stay away from that snake. So I go out hiking again. Oh, but look. This brown snake is is only two feet. It's certainly shorter than the other one, so it can't be the same snake. I mean, should I not fear this new snake? It's another brown snake. It's a little bit shorter, so it's definitely not the exact same one. But obviously, I'm going to generalize and also be a scare, be, be afraid of this other brown snake. You know. Um, because the first one hurt me. And it doesn't matter that's not the exact same one. It's close enough. And I'll probably be, be a little bit, you know, scared of of other colored snakes as well. <laughs> you know, if especially if if it was a frightening experience or if it caused some damage to me. And um I may I may avoid all snakes, you know. Um, you know, dogs are similar. Uh, so if somebody has a bad experience with a dog, let's say during childhood, and they get bit by a dog, then they're not just going to avoid that one dog and then be friendly with every other one. I mean, there's going to be some stimulus generalization. 
they're going to be afraid of any dogs that are similar to that one. In some cases, you they may generalize to all dogs, and people do this, so they have a bad experience with one dog, and they become afraid of every dog. Um, so there are different amounts of generalization that can go on. Um, and uh, let me give you one more example um, of just, you know, useful stimulus generalization. Suppose I'm off vac vacationing in a foreign country, and they have some slightly different shaded uh, uh, streetlights. So, like, you know, I'm coming up to the streetlight, and it's like, and it and there's a is it switches from green to this kind of, I don't know, orangey red light. It's certainly not the red light light that I'm used to. I mean, I think I better still stop. I think I better respond to it as if it is the same red light that I stop for all the time, you know, in my home country. Just because it's a different shade, I can't ignore it. Like I need to generalize and say well, that means the same thing. It's obviously different, it's a different stimulus, but it carries the same meaning. And this is why generalization is important. Often things are very similar. They they have similar functions or purposes or or there's similar dangers in some cases, like you know, snakes that are similar to one another. Um, so generalization basically means when we generalize, we we are responding to stimuli that are close enough to the original stimuli that we learned that we learned uh, uh, from originally. Okay, there's um, a somewhat opposite process called stimulus discriminate discrimination. And this occurs when one exhibits a, exhibits a particular condition response only to certain stimuli, but not to similar others. So it's like you're narrowing the amount of things that you respond to. Like, um, so let's say I'm that I'm that I'm that kid that got bit by a dog, and I ended up being afraid of all dogs originally. Well, probably over time, I would, you know, run across some poodles that, you know, maybe a friend has a poodle or something, and I find out how what a sweet dog it is, and it certainly isn't dangerous. And then I start noticing that there's that there's other kinds of dogs that are always gentle and nice, and you know, golden retrievers are really gentle and whatever. You know, various different dogs are have different temperaments and. And over time, I'm probably going to go from, from being afraid of all dogs to narrowing it down to just, you know, certain types of dogs that are like the one that bit me. So I might, you know, they might I might narrow down to just one breed of dogs that I'm afraid of now, or you know, or or just a couple of breeds, um, or just like certain size dogs. But that's what discrimination is. You, you differentiate between the, between stimuli even if they're somewhat similar you may you only respond to one but not the other you know you show you show a conditional response only to one but not the other and I'll give you another dog example um, just when we um my when my wife and I got our, our two dogs um uh, I don't know a lot of years ago that's uh, 12 or 13 years ago or something um uh, I remember, th and this was the first time I owned dogs, and um, and I was uh, whenever I, whenever they were outside in, in the back, and I would hear a dog bark. You know, I'd always be running out back because I didn't want my dogs being noisy dogs and bothering neighbors, and and you know, and I'd find out I'd go outside and find out it's not them. It's it's a neighbor dog or a dog across the street or something like that. Um, because I wasn't very good at discriminating originally. Um, I was generalizing, like any barking I heard, I just thought this might be my dogs. And, and you know, obviously I learned over time to discriminate my dogs' barks from other dogs' bark, barks. You know, I need to, to, to be able to tell the difference. And this is what happens. You, over time, you often discriminate more and more and 
and fine tune your perception. And, and so then I would only respond to if it was, if I knew it was my dogs that were causing a ruckus. And then if there's some other dog, I just ignore it. Um, so that's another example, stimulus discrimination. I only respond to a particular condition uh, stimulus, my 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 dogs bark barking, and and show show a response. But I don't respond to similar noises. Okay, and one final example here. This is from your book. Um, stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination help us learn about objects in the environment. When you touch poison ivy and get an itchy rash, you learn to fear this three-leafed plant, and so you avoid it. And poison ivy is shown there in the first picture. You may then experience stimulus generalization if you fear and avoid similar three-leafed plants, even non-poisonous ones, such as fragrant sumac, shown in the second picture. So it's also a three-leaf plant, but it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt you. But, you know, I can see somebody doing this if they have a bad experience with poison ivy. You don't want to take any chances, so you stay away from all plants that have three leaves. You may also experience stimulus discrimination related to poison ivy. That is, you do not fear or, or avoid dissimilar plants, such as a Virginia creeper, which has five leaves and is non-poisonous, uh, shown in this final picture. So, you know, you. There's always um, kind of like, um, I guess I like almost like a tug of war between these two processes. Like, like, like kind of like opposite things. Generalization means you're you're responding to more stimuli, a broader range of stimuli. Discrimination means you're fine tuning and responding to less stimuli. And 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 often the pattern goes that after some kind of um, conditioning or, or learning experience. You know, you you will uh, you may often like do kind of a wide generalization, like I'm not going to be touching any plants. You know, after I got that poison ivy, or I'm not going I'm I'm not going to go near any dogs after I got bit by a dog. Like, and then over time, you tend to start discriminating more. And it's just time goes by, you learn more, you you start to be able to tell the difference between different things, like different plants and whatnot. And so you fine tune and it's like, okay, now I know the difference between, you know, a, a Virginia creeper and a, and, a, and a poison ivy. And so I'm not going to be afraid of a Virginia creeper because I can tell it's different, you know. And, uh, okay. So those are, those are the processes of generalization and discrimination. You can um, learn fear responses through classical conditioning. And uh, and possibly acquire phobia, which is an acquired fear that is exaggerated in comparison to the real threat of an object or of a situation. Let's look at an example, a classic example. And um, this involves the case study of Little Albert, and it reveals that phobias can be learned through classical conditioning. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. Um, this was an um, ex experiment done by John Watson, uh, the founder of behaviorism, and he wanted to show that you could create a new fear in an, in an infant. That, that, you know, he wanted to say, show that this is where our fears come from. They get classically conditioned into us, and often when we're young. And so um, he went ahead and did this, and then his method was to um, introduce um actually let me go to the next slide as I talk about this. I, I put this um my template on here, my and filled it in, my classical conditioning template. So in so remember in step one you have to start off with um, some kind of uh, uh, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response relationship that already exists. Um, some kind of automatic um, uh, response to a stimulus. And, and this is what he did, because there are two fears we're, we are born with. Uh, 
we fear falling and we fear loud noises. Um, they're the only two fears you're you're born with. So you're not born afraid of any animals or or you know social situations or anything like that. You just don't want to fall and you don't you don't like loud noises. So he decided to use a loud noise as his unconditioned stimulus and it would cause the unconditioned response of fear. And this would happen with any infant. If you make it the noise loud enough, you'll cause you know, you, you'll cause babies to cry. Any babies. Okay. And then he, so he, he, he hasn't, he hasn't actually used the loud noise yet, but that, that's, that's what he kind of, that's what he set up to use. Um, the rat, he introduced a rat, a white furry rat to little Albert. Rat, the, little Albert had no fear of this rat. I mean, he was fine with it. He touched it. It like kind of ran around on his, in between his legs and stuff, and um, he showed no fear uh, uh, to the rat at all, just interest. Um, so, but then, you know, the conditioning started, and so Watson would put the rat, you know, in between little Albert's legs, um, so, like, and make sure he was looking right down at it, and then he would, behind little Albert's head, he would hit like a metal pipe with, with like a hammer or something like that. But he would create that loud clanging noise that would just scare the, you know, scare little Albert um, uh, terribly. And, and, and little Albert would end up crying. And, 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 and then he would, you know, he'd do this again. He would, he would do another trial where he brings a rat, white rat back, puts it down in front of him and then makes those loud noise and causes fear. So he's, Doing conditioning trials, he he presents the rat first, then you know very quickly followed by a loud noise, which unconditionally causes fear in little Albert. And after conditioning, then all he had to do was bring in the white rat, and little Albert would get very upset and cry. And uh, he was now afraid of the white rat, where he hadn't been before. Um, this fear response also generalized to any white furry objects, including a, a fur coat. He was afraid of some uh, some cotton wool uh, and uh, and also a Santa mask he was afraid of. I, I heard maybe a rabbit too, I'm not sure, but it was up. But things that were similar, that, they were, that were furry and white, um, he would show a fear response to. Um, I do want to point out that, that this is, um, you know, this is an oldie time experiment, 1920s. Um, uh, looking back, you know, it's it's this is certainly would be considered an unethical experiment today. You could not do this. It, you know, you are building a, um, you know, implanting a fear into an infant. Um, it is not. It would not be considered ethical experimentation. And you would not be able to be, able, be allowed to proceed with this kind of study. But the rules were very different in the early days of psychology. Um, okay. And oh, by the way, um, there's um, little Albert. Uh, th there was going to be a second phase where they remove the fear, but little Albert was pulled from the experiment by his mother and and um, and they never did the second phase of, of trying to remove the fear that that uh, John Brown had created or oh, sorry John Brown John Watson sorry that John Watson had created um, it took a long time I, I when I early in my earlier years in psychology um, there was often wonderment about who little Albert was and it was only, you know, somewhat recent. I, I, I think after his death um, in 2007, that this became um, public knowledge that this was probably Little Albert. Um, at least that's what the best evidence seems to indicate. Um, so we believe that he was William Albert Barger. He died in 2007 at the age of 87. His relatives described him as easygoing, 
so he does not seem to have suffered long-term problems from being in the study. My assumption was always that this this kid was going to be messed up, you know, with, with some phobias already implanted in him at, as an infant, but apparently not so much. Uh, however, he was described as disliking animals, so that may come from his experience with the rat, especially dogs, and throughout his life, and he covers the ears when he heard barking, and that may come from the loud noise that Watson used to scare him as an infant. Anyways, uh, that is the Little Albert case study. Um, so counter conditioning is, is what they were going to do with Little Albert, but instead they ended up doing it with Little Peter. Okay, so counter conditioning is exposing a subject to their phobia during an enjoyable task. So you're now like, you're, you're, tr you're trying to now create an association between something that they really like um, and what the thing that they fear. And so, you know, if you can create that pairing, then, then they, it should lessen their, their, their fear of that object. And, and, um, and you should be able to get rid of the phobia. And so, so you want to pair something pleasant with the feared object. And this is what they did with, with little Peter. He had a rat, uh, sorry, a rabbit phobia. And uh, the person that did this experiment was Mary Cover Jones. And you didn't need to know her name. It could be on the test. Mary Cover Jones. She was a student of Watson's. And uh, she used Peter's favorite candy as an unconditioned stimulus to cure his rabbit phobia. So whenever she'd bring them, like she would give him candy and then, you know, bring the, bring the rabbit in. Um, or wait, or bring the, she, actually the rabbit, let me just think of how you would do this. Um, bu -bu 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 you want? Oh yeah, you'd want to, you'd want to bring the rabbit in um, first, you, it causes some fear, and then you give the candy, uh, which would cause a pleasant response, his favorite candy, and and so, and with that pairing, rabbit with candy, rabbit with candy, you know, pairing, uh, so the candy always gives a pleasant response, so eventually, you don't have to give the candy, you just do the, give the rabbit, and it would cause a pleasant response. Anyway, so, okay, so that's called counter conditioning, it's kind of undoing past conditioning by re doing a reverse kind of process. Okay, learning is critical for survival. Certain pairings of stimuli are more likely to be associated than others. Uh, we'll look at a couple of examples. Some condition taste aversion is one. Um, new, new foods are especially likely pr to produce learned aversions. This is adaptive because eating foods that make us ill can jeopardize our survival. Um, so a condition taste aversion is is where you've been had some kind of uh, experience. Usually, like you've eaten or drank, eaten or drank something, you've gotten sick, and then you can't stand the thought of ever eating that food again, or smelling it, or you know, or, or whether it's a food or a drink. Um, a lot of us have these. Um, these taste aversions for for various things, uh, but they're they're different than normal conditioning procedure. When we looked, just to go back real quick, when we looked at this graph here, you know, I mentioned that acquisition happened fairly quickly. That you know, it was up to maximum level after about six trials. Well, with conditioned taste aversion, it only takes one trial. It doesn't take multiple trials. So that's one thing that's different than regular conditioning. Is you can learn a pairing between, you know, a food or a drink and, and, and getting sick like in, in one one trial. You don't have to do it more than once. Um, and this is adaptive. I mean, if something like if you're in the woods, you know, uh, foraging for food and something makes you really sick, you don't want to go try that same food again, you know, before you learn. So um, so you want to learn in one trial, and that's what we do. 
Um, the other thing that's special about it is there can be a large gap between the the conditioned stimulus and, and the unconditioned stimulus. So between like the food and getting sick, um, in normal in normal conditioning, you want you want the two things to be very close together. Like you you play the metronome and then you give the food like you know a couple of seconds later. Um, with conditioned taste aversion, they could be spread apart by like six hours or something. And there, there's certainly examples of this. So you go out to dinner and like you know at six p.m. in the evening, and then you get sick at midnight. I mean, you're still going to blame that food that you ate. And so it can be a long gap, and you could still end up with an aversion. Um, so they develop after only one trial. There can be a large gap between uh, the stimulus and, and, and response. And, uh, and they also show little generalization. They don't generalize to other foods that are similar. Like It's often restricted to that one particular food that you think or drink that you think made you sick. Um, I'll just give you one of my examples. Um, I, as a child, I, I um, had a Armenian friend, and um, I was at his house, and he offered me some rye bread. And we we never ate rye bread at my house. And this was really strong rye bread that they had, and um, I ate some, and I I immediately went to his bathroom and was throwing up. Uh, I just couldn't stomach it. And, you know, and that, that was as a child. And I can't stand the smell of rye bread or, or the taste. As soon as I, sometimes I mistakenly don't realize that there's rye in, in some bread and I start to take a bite and, and I, you know, that as soon as I get that little bit of flavor, I'm just, I, I have to put it down right away. Um, and so like, it, uh, you know, it can, this, this, uh, a version developed 50 years ago for me, and 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 it still is powerful to this day. Um, it tends to happen more with distinctive foods and or drinks, uh, especially if you if you get sick the first time you try it. So that, like I said, I wasn't rye rye bread was not um, something I commonly ate. I, I don't know if I'd ever had it before that time. So um, that and especially. The, the rye bread that, that they had um, was very distinctive. Uh, it happens, like, a lot of people develop taste aversion to, like, tequila. It has a very unique taste to it. And um, and it's easy to kind of, it is some an easy kind of liquor to, to get sick on. And if you do, like, it's, you avoid tequila. You don't avoid other kinds of alcohol because it, it has such a distinctive flavor that it's just it's there's no generalization to other other drinks you but you you can certainly you know recognize that flavor or that smell um i'll mention uh, one, one other thing um um when people go for chemotherapy treatments um knowing ahead of time that they might get sick um, doctors will often suggest that they eat some kind of scapegoat food before, you know, as their last meal before they come in for chemotherapy, because the chemotherapy might cause them to get sick to their stomachs and feel nauseous. Um, they may actually develop taste aversions. It doesn't matter that you know cognitively that, oh, it's the chemo, it's not the food. It's just these taste aversions can be so powerful and they're so they're kind of like programmed into us as animals. It's an adaptive response in animals, including humans, that they, you know, to avoid things that make you sick. And so they would tell people often, like, eat something that you don't mind losing from your diet forever. Like, you know, something that you don't really care that much about, some kind of food that you, you can do without. Like, just in case you develop a taste aversion, you don't want it to be something that you regularly like or enjoy and so they they suggest scapegoat foods like something that you you don't really care about okay uh just a few more slides here um continuing with the idea of um that certain parents of stimuli are more likely to be associated than others 
we have this idea of biological, biologically prepared by or preparedness is, is often the term he uses. Um, it comes from Seligman, Martin Seligman. Um, and basically, this idea of biologically prepared is, is that we're genetically programmed in certain ways. Um, and, you know, I'll go through them here. First of all, our auditory and visual systems are programmed and prepared for potential dangers. So animals, including humans, have evolved to be able to detect threats. Um, so if you look at this picture over here on the right, um, you, you'll quickly see, you know, the, a, a snake, you know, in that top set of pictures, if, if the target, you know, you, the target is to look for a snake among the flowers and people find it very quickly. But when you try to find the flower among the snakes in the, in the bottom set, it takes people longer. Why? Because our eyes are drawn to the snakes because they are a potential danger, whereas flowers are not. So it's 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 like we we automatically are going to notice snakes faster than we're going to notice flowers. So the the idea is just to continue on the screen here. We are evolutionary evolutionarily predisposed to be more afraid of certain things than of others because they were a threat to our evolutionary ancestors. So it's, it's kind of like it's, you know, built into our DNA. It's genetically programmed. If something has always been a threat to humans, then it's kind of been, you know, it, it's been passed down through your, through your, your genes um, that, that, it would be so that it's easy for us, you know, to be afraid of those things as well. So lots of people are afraid of things like snakes, which have always been around as long as humans and fire, which has always been a danger. Heights is a common fear. It's always been a danger. Darkness. Um, uh, whereas people are a lot less likely to, to develop phobias for new kinds of dangers that weren't around, you know, in in early man or you know uh, in, in history like i don't know identity theft or something like that that's scary but you don't really find people with phobias of, of that like you find a lot of people with snake phobias or height phobias or um you know um darkness phobias or spider phobias which have always been a danger um so this is it makes some sense we're more likely to be afraid of things that have always been a threat to humans. And so this is, these are just a couple of the examples, the taste aversion and the biolog bi biologically preparedness are examples of, of adaptation, you know, affecting, um, affecting us, okay, let's just say affecting us, affecting animals. Um, and affecting, you know, how conditioning works with us. Oh, yeah. And well, moving on to cognition um, and its effects. Classical conditioning helps animals predict the occurrence of, of events. Uh, Robert, Robert Riscorla, back in the 60s, conducted one of the first studies that highlighted the role of cognition. That You know, that is like thinking. Cognition is thinking in learning. Um, he found that conditioning is easier when the conditioned stimulus precedes the unconditioned stimulus, stimulus rather than when the conditioned stimulus follows the unconditioned stimulus. And this did come up earlier. And it's because if, it, if the conditioned stimulus comes before, then it's, it's predictive and meaningful. So when that metronome, you know, makes a noise before the, before the dog gets the food, then the metronome serving a, a predictive purpose. Um, and, and the reason why this is important, you may say, well, that's obvious that it should come before, but like, you know, the old idea was that you're learning just to associate the two things together. And, and if that's the case, it shouldn't really matter which, which order they come in. Like if you're just learning to pair them, like the metronome gets paired with the food, you know, like you learn that, that 
the 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 met that they that they go together, and um, um, then it wouldn't really matter you know, which one comes first. But the cognitive idea is that well, the reason why conditioning works is because is because the condition stimulus the metronome it it serves a predictive purpose. It it's it's telling you that something important is about to happen. Like you know, you're about to receive food, for instance. Um and 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 so then it, it has to come first to to serve that role. It is not being predictive if it comes after. Anyway, so he showed that this was indeed the case. You want the conditioned stimulus right before the unconditioned stimulus. Uh, and also the cognitive model of classical learning states that the amount of conditioning that occurs is determined by how surprising the unconditioned stimulus is. Um, so when an unconditioned stimulus is unexpected or surprising, it causes an animal to pay more attention to their environment. And so the animal's more likely to notice a predictive stimulus. So what we mean by this, and, and so it's, it's the un, and by the way, um, uh, I should mention, you know, these last few slides, I've changed the notes around on them. Um, they're different than what I, I provided online. So, you know, make note of that. It used to say that it was the condition stimulus that, um, that that was important for the amount of conditioning that occurs, but it's really the unconditioned stimulus, so it's which is the food. So, like, if an animal also gets a bowl of food in front of him, and he was completely had no expectation of it, there was no signals, no warnings, no nothing predictive of it, then what, that would be surprising to the animal, and they would like they would kind of look around, like they would, they would pay attention what. That's just happened. Is there anything that you know could have that could have told me that this food was coming? Um, it's we we because receiving food is an important event. We we would like to be able to predict when it's happening. We like some kind of signal. So so this is what this means is that when when you know when a uh, when you get um. An unexpected stimulus that causes you to have an un yeah, um, unconditioned response. Like um, you, you want to learn like when that when that unconditioned stimulus is going to come again. Like you, right away, you you're going to look around and say, you know, what, you know, wh how could I have known this this was going to come? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm explaining that right. Make sure you do read it in the book though, but. Even in the books, it's a little confusing, but it's it's about that when something's unexpected, you pay attention to your surroundings and to the environment. And this is what it shows in this final, you know, in, in this little example here. So this dog is normally always gets his can of food opened by an electric can opener. He's become used to that noise. He always comes, as soon as he hears it, he comes running in the kitchen because he knows he's about to get his food, okay? But, but then the electric can opener breaks down and his owner has to use this um, manual can opener, which doesn't make any noise or doesn't make the same kind of noise. And so when this dog re receives his food this time, it's he's surprised. He's, it's unexpected. He always knew when it was coming because he would hear this machine going and he would start wagging his tail before he even got his food because he, he he could predict that it was coming. Now he is he's surprised, it's unexpected. You can see the question marks. And so he's he's gonna like do a quick scan of the room. Like he's gonna he's gonna make note. Um like I'm not saying he's doing deep thinking here, but he's gonna make note of of anything like new in the environment and and if he's, you know, if the, let's say the owner is still carrying this this can opener in their hand, like that would be probably a new thing that he doesn't normally see, and um, and he'd probably make a note of it. And so, and then if it happens again, and he gets food, and he sees the same thing again, like he's going to quickly learn, you know, that oh now 
this is what predicts when that food is coming. When I see this red handle instrument, that means my food is coming soon. And and this is a the idea behind this is that you know we if something's expected or unsurprising, we're not going to look around the environment and try to figure out, oh, why did that happen? Like, even though I expected it, like, I mean, like, it, there'd be no need to. If, if you, if, when things aren't expected or normal or, or unsurprising, you know, you don't really worry. But when something happens that's unexpected or surprising, we humans, as well as anim, any other animals, we take note of circumstances and, and environmental conditions. And, and this is why learning can, can happen quickly with classical conditioning. Um, it's like that metronome. I mean, that dog had probably never heard a metronome before, before, and all of a sudden, like, you know, there's, there's this new instrument, metronome, and, and, and the food was coming right after, and like, it, if, if the food was surprising to, to the dog, then it would make note of this, hey, there was a clicking sound right before I got it. And, and then it would notice it again. And, and that's why it doesn't take long is because you pay attention when presented with an unexpected or surprising unconditioned stimulus, such as a bowl of food that just shocks you. Okay, and that's about it then for this learning objective.